Well, I'll go ahead and get us started um, and welcome you all. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm Melanie Bocanegra. I'm the AVP of Student Success here at CSUN. And I'm your co-host today uh, for our Steps Towards Implementing Institutional Change program featuring Dr. Sean Harper. If you need interpreters, um, we have Kevin, interpreter Kevin, and Hafet, um, who you should see on the screen. And um, so hopefully you can see their names, you can spotlight them. And now I will hand it over to my other co-host, Deborah Hammond, the Executive Director of the University Student Union at CSUN. Great, thank you, Melanie. I'm excited to be here this afternoon. And before we begin today's program, I want to welcome Dwayne Johnson, who will be presenting CSUN's land acknowledgement. Thank you, Deborah. Um, like mentioned before, my name is Dwayne Johnson, and I am the Student Diversity's Initiatives Assistant at the University Student Union. We want to start today's program by respecting and acknowledging the land in which we currently reside. We know acknowledgements are used by native people and non-natives to recognize indigenous peoples who are the original stewards of the land on which we now live. California State University Northridge recognizes and acknowledges the Sesave Tom, the first people of this ancestral and unceded territory of Sesavenga that is now occupied by our institution. And it honors their, el their elders, past and present, and the Sesavitam descendants who are now, who are the citizens of the Fernandino Tataviam Band of Mission Indians. We recognize that the Sesavitam are still here and we are committed to uplifting their stories, culture, and community. Consistent with our CSUN values of respecting all people, and our alliances with the community, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to native peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and we will work to hold California State University Northridge accountable to the needs of American Indian peoples in the region. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for doing um, today's land acknowledgement. Um, our program today will help us apply a social justice and anti-racism framework to our student organizations, our student services, our classrooms and campus environments in an effort to continue to move CSUN forward and really um, continuously think about how we enact change on our campus. Um, this program is really a collaborative event um, with, with the help of the Chief Diversity Office and, of course, our Matador Success Series Planning Committee and the University Student Union. Um, this is truly embodying our mission to create a unified campus conversation to empower student success, and it could not have been done, been done without the work of all of these folks. So I appreciate you. Um, and I just want to thank everyone again for joining us today. Um, so in the chat, you'll see some logistical and housekeeping items. So please feel free to look at the chat um, if you need any um, assistance. Okay. All right. So now um, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Mary Beth Walker, uh, the Provost and Vice President of Academic Affairs. She brings a wealth of um, experience implementing high impact practices and helping us eliminate our racial equity gaps. So without further ado, I'll let Dr. Walker welcome us. Thank you very much, Melanie, and hello, everybody. Welcome, thank you for coming to the first event of the Matador Success Series. Remember what success stands for? Supporting unified campus conversations to empower student success. And this is the first of those conversations this fall. So our Matador Success Committee was inspired. They 
just do excellent work. They were inspired by the progress we've made as a campus in, in dealing with dual pandemics. So we have the racial justice movements and we have the ongoing realities of COVID. And we, are, we continue to work our way through these to, to uh, move towards success. The theme that the committee chose this year is really a challenge for each of us. Um, we want to renew, we want to redefine, and we want to reimagine our campus as the leader, the leader in serving students from all backgrounds and all walks of life during these unprecedented circumstances. We need to find innovative ways to launch the careers of the next generation leaders, the next generation public servants and entrepreneurs and academics and school teachers and activists, the change makers that our world needs. So I really like it as Melanie said that if the goal is supporting unified campus conversations, then we do need all the partnerships. So the partnership with the university student union and the chief diversity office, that's, that's a great example of a unified campus conversation. We will address racial justice in the context of student success. So our first speaker in the series is Dr. Sean Harper. As you all know, he is a world renowned scholar. He currently leads the Race and Equity Center at USC. Just a preview, our next event coming up in November will focus on the students we serve and will center their experiences. Dr. Harper, I uh, remembered reading one of your papers back before I, I came to CSUN uh, several years ago. Um, and uh, I, was, I looked at it again the last couple of days is, was re-inspired by some of the work that you've done. With the guidance of speakers like Dr. Harper and, and learning from individuals uh, such as Dr. Harper, it's my mission to embody the changes we need to see on campus. I want to do this work in the best possible way for our students and our community. So we need to demonstrate, I want to do this every day, demonstrate care for our students who've lost loved ones and had their lives upended as the result of these dual pandemics. So it's time for us to come together and to renew and redefine and reimagine CSUN together. So I'm gonna hand it back over to Deborah Hammond and she will formally introduce our distinguished speaker. Thank you, Provost Walker. It is now my pleasure and honor to introduce our esteemed guest. Dr. Sean Harper is one of the nation's most highly respected racial equity experts. He is a provost professor in the Rossier School of Education and the Marshall School of Business at the University of Southern California. He is also the Clifford and, and, and Betty Allen Chair in Urban Leadership, founder and executive director of the USC Race and Equity Center, an immediate past president of the American Educational Research Association. He has also served as the 2016-17 Association for the Study of Higher Education president and was elected to the National Academy of Education in 2021. Dr. Harper's research focuses primarily on race, gender, and other dimensions of equity. In, array, in an array of organizational contexts, including K through 12 schools, colleges, universities, and corporations. He has published 12 books and over a hundred other academic publications. His research has been cited in nearly 17,000 published studies across a vast array of academic fields and disciplines. Atlantic Philanthropies, I can never get that out, and the Bill and Melinda Gates, Luminati, um, Ford, Kellogg, College Futures, Cressy, Sloan, and Open Society Foundations have awarded him more than $17 million in grants. He is truly the real deal. The New York Times, Washington Post, 
Wall Street Journal, Chronicle of Higher Education, and several thousand news outlets have quoted Professor Harper and featured his research. He has also been interviewed on CNN, ESPN, Black News Channel, and NPR. And let me go off script for a minute. It is a pleasure to behold Dr. Harper's facial expressions during CNN interviews when another guest has said something inane. Let's just say he doesn't have a poker face. He has also testified twice to the United States House of Representatives and spoken at numerous White House convenings. Dr. Harper served as President Barack Obama's My Brother's Keeper Advisory Council on the National Education Policy Committee for the Biden-Harris campaign and on the California and on California Governor Gavin Newsom's statewide task force on higher education, racial equity, and COVID-19 recovery. The recipient of dozens of top honors in his field and one honorary doctorate. Professor Harper has been repeatedly recognized in Education Week as one of the 10 most influential scholars in the field of education. It's absolutely great to have you here, Dr. Harper. Our CSUN campus has a history of student activism and staff and faculty who want to support our students and the campus community to combat racial injustices. We understand and acknowledge that this heavy work falls on the shoulders of advocates and passionate individuals who want to see change. This work does cause racial battle fatigue among student activists, as well as the faculty and staff who are committed to racial justice in higher ed, including at CSUN. Over the next 45 minutes or so, we plan to listen and learn from you followed by a 30 minute Q&A, which is based on questions that participants have already sent in in advance or will be able to present during the presentation. I now present to you, Dr. Sean Harper. Okay. <clears throat> I was just introduced by the incomparable Deborah Hammond. And Deborah Hammond called me the real deal. All I can say back to you, my sister, is that it takes one to know one. I am enormously privileged to have known the real deal so early in my career in higher education. When I entered the higher education profession 23 years ago, I got my start in college unions and student activities. Deborah Hammond just told you that I've now served as president of two national associations in the field of higher education. What she didn't tell you though, is that both of my presidencies were inspired by her possibility model. When I entered the field, Deborah Hammond had served as the national president of the Association of College Unions International. She was a black woman role model and mentor to me so early in my career. It means the world to me, Deborah, 23 years later, to have just been introduced in such a loving and generous fashion by you. You continue to inspire me. I don't know how in the world you maintain your fabulousness uh, all these years later, but I'm just so grateful, Deborah, uh, for you being such a shining example of what black excellence looks like for me 23 years ago. Um, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Everybody, hello. It is really, really, really wonderful to be with you this afternoon. I've been looking forward to our time together for a long time. So thank you for taking time out of your day and out of your lives uh, to come and be with me for these you know, 45 minutes or hour and 15 minutes or so that remain as we talk about what it takes to actualize and sustain anti-racism at the California State University Northridge. I want to acknowledge that this is my second time 
having the privilege of speaking to members of your campus community. Uh, the first time was six years ago when I delivered the Terry Piper Distinguished Lecture, which is a, a speech that I will always treasure. At that time, I dedicated that particular speech in one fashion or another to Deborah Hammond and continue to be uh, grateful to her. Uh, but this time I wanna dedicate this one um, to another special someone, uh, Sam Prater. I met Sam Prater for the first time six years ago when I delivered the Terry Piper lecture. Sam at the time was an early career staff person in student affairs there um, in res life uh, at CSUN. Sam came up to me at the end of my talk and he and I just immediately connected. Um, Sam, now six years later, has become one of my closest, dearest friends, not just here in Los Angeles, but really all, all uh, everywhere in the world. Um, I am indebted to CSUN for affording me the space to meet Sam Prater for the first time and to cultivate such a beautiful friendship with him. Sam wanted me to make sure that you all knew that he is alive and well. So this is not an in memoriam uh, dedication. Sam is in good shape. Um, but I did want to make sure that I just acknowledge that it was CSUN that brought Sam and me together as friends. All right, hey, let's get into it. Uh, we're gonna talk about anti-racism and you know what it takes to actualize and sustain it. Let me... Um, in as much as I very much appreciated all of the things that uh, Deborah just did to establish my credibility as a scholar, let me try to just like add just a little more to it so that you all know that I'm not just coming here with anecdotes. Uh, I'm going to talk for just a second here about our campus racial climate research um, at the USC Race and Equity Center, because a lot of what I have chosen to share with you today is very much informed by that campus racial climate research. I mentioned to you that I've worked in higher ed for the past 23 years. 18 of those years has been as a faculty member. For 17 of those years, I've been consistently engaged in the qualitative assessment of campus racial climates. Uh, so really for the entirety of my faculty career, um, but also when I founded the Penn Race and Equity Center at the University of Pennsylvania a decade ago, doing campus racial climate assessments became a flagship activity of the center. When I moved the center from Penn to USC four years ago, you know, again, doing campus racial climates uh, continued to be, uh, climate assessments continued to be a focal activity of the USC Race and Equity Center. So we have now conducted these qualitative climate assessments at 59 colleges and universities in every geographic region of the United States and across a range of institution types, including lots of institutions that are compositionally and otherwise very similar to Cal State Northridge. In the qualitative version of our climate assessments, we usually go with a team of researchers from the center and spend about four days on the campus conducting racially homogeneous focus group interviews. So we have several focus groups just with indigenous uh, members of the campus community, several with just Asian Americans, several with Pacific Islanders, uh, several with Latinx uh, members of the campus community, several with black folks, several with uh, multiracial folks, and always, always several focus groups with white people white members of the campus community because they too are indeed a part of the campus racial climate. Um, you know, we, over the years, sometimes, uh, by the way, Provost Walker, thank you for the warm welcome and thank you for reading my paper and rereading it uh, recently. That means a lot to me. Um, you know, sometimes college presidents, provosts and VPs will reach out to us and ask if we could come and assess the campus racial climate for employees. Over the years, we have interviewed more than 2000 faculty members, staff members, and administrators on their campuses about the campus racial climate. Perhaps more impressively, over the years, we have interviewed face-to-face, in-person, not on the phone, not on Zoom, 
uh, on the campuses in person, we have interviewed more than 10,000 undergraduate students about the realities and complexities of the racial climate um, at their institutions. So this is my way of saying that, you know, so much of what I'm going to bring to you today is informed by, you know, the more than 12,000 faculty members, staff members, administrators, and students who have very generously over those 17 years offered us qualitative insights. In case that isn't enough, all right, like some of you may be like, yeah, I'm not impressed by the interviewing of 12,000 people. All right, let me uh, tell you what else we've been up to. We've taken the best of what we learned over all of those years of assessing uh, campus climates qualitatively, and we used it to inform the design of a quantitative tool uh, for higher education institutions. Uh, at this time, let me give you a quick introduction to what we now call the National Assessment of Collegiate Campus Climates. The National Assessment of Collegiate Campus Climates, also known as the NAC, is a quantitative survey that will be administered annually at hundreds of participating colleges and universities across the United States. Through the NAC, thousands, perhaps millions, of college students will offer useful insights into the realities and complexities of race in higher education. NAC respondents will help us understand how various populations differently experience the colleges and universities they attend, where and what they learn about race, their feelings of preparedness for citizenship in a racially diverse democracy after college, and how racial issues in our broader society affect interactions and experiences on campuses. The USC Race and Equity Center will help institutional leaders use NAC survey results to improve racial climates, college experiences, and student outcomes. So you may have noticed that my colleague from our center was speaking in future tense about what the NAC will do um, what it will achieve, so on and so forth. Since that time, we've actually launched the National Assessment of Collegiate Campus Climates. Uh, we launched it in February 2019. During the 2019-2020 academic school year, the NAC was administered to more than a half million undergraduate students at colleges and universities across the United States. By the end of this academic school year, the NAC will have been administered to more than two million students at colleges and universities across the United States. So really we have both qualitative and now quantitative insights into campus racial climates um, all across the US. In the interest of time, I don't think you want me to go down the rabbit hole of attempting to summarize for you what we've learned from interviewing 12,000 folks and surveying nearly 2 million students. We'd be here all day, night, and into tomorrow. Uh, so I won't do that. What I will do instead, though, is talk with you about some trends that we've noticed in our work at the center with colleges and universities. We don't just survey people. We also do strategic racial equity advising with higher ed leaders and you know, folks who've jumped on the, on the equity bandwagon, you may have noticed that equity is on trend right now. It's what diversity was when Deborah Hammond and I first met uh, back in 1998, right? Diversity was the sort of flavor of the day. It was on trend at that time. You know, it's equity now, right? Like we see and hear equity here, there, and everywhere. Well, I wanna talk with you uh, in the interest of time as CSUN aspires to become an anti-racist institution. That's amazing. It's also amazing that you aspire to close racial equity gaps and actually achieve and hopefully sustain equity. That's great. Let me talk with you though about eight mistakes or eight ways in which I've seen other campuses mishandle the journey that you've put yourselves on as a way of like saying, don't do that, right? Don't do these eight things. Well, look, lots of well-intended institutions will attempt to achieve racial equity with no data on the campus racial climate. I wanna be fair here and acknowledge that folks bring various forms of data to the table, right? First to second year persistence, student retention in major, uh, student academic performance, student engagement data, uh, graduation rates, you know, those forms of data, you know, will help 
paint a picture for us of where the racial inequities are. But they don't fully explain why those inequities are so consistently and repeatedly manufactured at the university. We're going nowhere fast in achieving racial equity, and we're certainly going nowhere fast in a so-called pursuit of becoming anti-racist without data that actually tell us the truth about the challenges and opportunities that we have as it pertains to the campus racial climate. Another thing that happens um, in the trendiness of equity, right, is that there are these imprecise notions of equity at most institutions, right? We've asked president's leadership teams, for example, you know, what does the university mean by equity? If there are 10 people on the leadership team, we're gonna get nine different articulations. Um, one of those people are gonna say, I don't even know what, I don't even know what we mean. So I'm not even gonna, uh, not going to attempt. The other nine will at least attempt, but it's going to be very different, right? So there are these broad, imprecise notions of equity. Let me be very thoughtful and responsible here. As a black gay man, I very much care about equity for queer members of the campus community. As a gender studies scholar, I, very, I care very deeply about equity for women and for gender queer people and for men. So I care about gender equity. The point here though, is that weirdly, weirdly institutions that put themselves on a anti-racism uh, mission, you know, and attempt to take on equity, for some reason, have a hard time naming race specifically. Their notions of equity are deliberately raceless. Why? Because race is so hard for people to talk about. They don't know how to talk about it. So they just talk about equity in the abstract. All right. There's also uh, inattention to reparations. Reparations for historical negligence, inequity, harm, and violence that the institution has enacted on various communities over centuries or over decades. Um, in many instances, I so very much appreciated that we started today's experience with the land acknowledgement. It's really important, but we also have to acknowledge the ways in which we have historically and continue contemporarily to erase the needs and experiences of indigenous students and employees at the institutions. It's not just enough to do the land acknowledgement. We have to also acknowledge what is real in the persistent erasure and the underserving of indigenous members of our campus communities. Let me say just another word here about reparations. Many well-intended institutions that jump on the anti-racism man wagon in 2021 will attempt to solve 2021 problems with only a 2021 understanding of what those problems are without also acknowledging that what we see, the inequities that we see in 2021 date back to 2011, to 2001, to 1991, 81, 71, 61, and so on, right? There's been an accumulation over the years of the disadvantage that too many members of our campus communities who are people of color experience. These problems didn't just show up knocking on the campus door at 2021. 20, we have to pay attention to what happened over the generations and therefore repair that harm that the institution has inflicted on those groups. Fourth, whew, all right, trendy. It's so trendy right now for colleges and universities to have their little equity work groups, commissions, task forces. I'm gonna call them task forces uh, henceforth. Normally a well-intended, I suppose, president, provost, VP, will commission an equity task force. It's a group normally comprised of employees, smart people. I want to acknowledge that these are smart people who are often selected to be on the equity task force, right? Well, task force gets commissioned by an administrator and they're supposed to spend a year working on an equity report or some sort of equity plan for the university. 
it might surprise you that in our observations of equity task force meetings, so sometimes researchers from our center will actually observe these equity task force meetings. They're typically two hours, once a month, over the course of a nine month academic school year. So we're talking 18 hours of the task force task forcing and meeting, right? All right, so we observe for 18 hours, the task force, we sit in the corner and we just observe them meeting two hours a month over nine months. Hmm. How curious that it's the September meeting and nobody's talking about race. Maybe it's that, you know, everybody is familiarizing themselves with the president's charge to the task force. So maybe they'll get to it in October. No, they didn't say a word about race in October. Hmm. November? Mm -mm. April? Nope. Still not a word about race. Even when there's a member of the equity task force who's from the Office of Institutional Research who brings data to the table. And those data show us that there are racial gaps and inequities between you know, groups of students or between employees on particular employment outcomes or whatever. The data show us that these are racial inequities, but yet nobody's talking about race on the equity task force. They're skillfully talking around race using semantic substitutes like our underserved students or our disadvantaged, who are they? Turn to the data table here in this stack of reports that the IR person on the team just gave you. Who are the, the disadvantaged and the underserved? Name them. Name the conditions that might be leading to the outcomes that we see. You know, look, the point here is that well-intended folk will spend 18 hours, bless their hearts, working on an equity plan for the institution and never once say a word about race, about racism, about racist institutional cultures, norms, mindsets, curricula, hiring practices, and so on. Well, perhaps then it shouldn't surprise you. Number five of the eight typical approaches is that this well-intended equity task force, very smart people produced you an 80 page equity plan uh, that says not one word about race. How could I say so, so declaratively? Really not one word? Well, yeah, it's because I tend to have a habit of collecting equity plans. I can't help myself. I, I collect them in PDF. Every single time I do the same thing to these equity plans that I see from institutions throughout California and around the country. I will open the PDF and I'll simply do a control F, not the most methodologically rigorous thing that I do in my research, I must admit, but I'll do a control F on my computer and it opens up the little find window in the upper right-hand corner. I will type into the search window, race, racial, racist, racism, black, African-American, Asian, Asian-American, Pacific Islander, indigenous, Native American, American Indian, white, Latino, Latinx, Chicano, multiracial, so on and so forth. It may shock you that the overwhelming majority of equity plans for institutions return no results to any of those terms, especially the first set, race, racism, racial, so on. Now, where we do see the actual names of the racial groups show up in the equity reports or the equity plan, is in the data tables. The data tables that are either sprinkled throughout the report or included as appendices at the end. Those data tables make painstakingly clear that these are racial inequities between and among groups on either student outcomes or employee outcomes. It could be, as a matter of fact, that the data tables make really clear that it is Black women students who are most underserved by the institution on this particular student success metric, says it on the data table on page 61. But yet in the narrative of the report, it says nothing about black women. 
there's a whole set of recommendations on how to improve student success on this particular student success metric. But yet it says not a word about black women, but yet the data table shows us that it's black women who are most underserved. Look, the point here is that these raceless equity reports and plans, no, nope, we're going nowhere fast. We're going nowhere fast. Let me see if I can speed this up so I can get to some recommendations for you, um, honestly. So a couple other things we see. There's a lopsided emphasis often in the equity plan on student deficits, on student talent or the lack thereof, on student engagement or the lack thereof, right? So, you know, the equity work group or, you know, others across the campus are so fascinated by trying to understand why these students are not succeeding, these students of color. And the onus is placed almost entirely on them, the students. Not enough onus placed on the institution. Not enough onus placed on institutional responsibility for the manufacturing of racial inequities in student outcomes or employee outcomes. Six. Mm -mm -mm. Mm -mm -mm. I don't mean to disappoint you, Deborah Hammond. I came into this field as a student affairs professional, and I will always be a student affairs professional at heart, always. Deborah, I have so much respect for the work that you and other student affairs colleagues do um, all across the country. I don't mean at all to disrespect or otherwise minimize the important work of student affairs professionals or culture center directors or people who work in multicultural affairs or in the chief diversity officers unit. I don't mean to disrespect those folks. I have so much respect for them. Look, the thing is though, the thing is, the equity strategy has far too little emphasis on dismantling classroom racism. The things that happen in classrooms. Yes, people come to your beautiful university student union there at Cal State Northridge. I know they do, I've been in it, it's a beautiful space, they come there. But the one place that every student has to go is class. Our data from our campus racial climate assessments repeatedly make clear to us that students of color experience tremendous racial stress, racial stereotyping, racial microaggressions, and racism in classrooms and in the curriculum. So why then is there not more attention placed on dismantling classroom racism? Well, it's because there is a presumption that the faculty is untouchable because of our academic freedom. Look, let me not be a hypocrite here. I'm a tenured professor, a tenured full professor. I very much enjoy my academic freedom, but that doesn't give me the freedom or, or the license to be racist and do racist things and uphold a colonialist curriculum. Um, yeah, no, no, my academic freedom doesn't give me license to do that. It doesn't give me license to stereotype Latinx students. It doesn't give me license to semester after semester after semester participate in the erasure of Asian American, Pacific Islander and indigenous people. It doesn't give me license to do that. But yet there is this presumption that, well, we can't touch the faculty because of their academic freedom. Let me give you two more. All right. Mm. One other approach to racial equity. One other way in which it's mishandled is that frankly, there's no remediation of racial illiteracy among the folks who work at colleges and universities, faculty members, staff members, and administrators. The truth is, the truth is, those of us who work in higher education are mere byproducts of our own educational upbringings. The truth is, too little is taught and learned in K-12 schools, in college, and in graduate school about race and racism. There's too little professional learning for those of us who then become professionals along our professional learning, our, our professional journeys, 
there's too little professional learning that's focused specifically on race and racial equity. Yeah, I don't know how we're going to achieve racial equity if the folks who are supposed to be leading us in doing it don't know what they're doing. Why? Because they were never taught. So then how are they going to close racial equity gaps? How are they going to ensure that we achieve racial equity? How are they going to help us uh, create an inclusive campus environment for racially minoritized people of color? How are they going to uh, know what to do when white nationalists and white supremacists show up to poison the campus community? Hmm, these folks don't even know how to talk about race, let alone do all these things that I just talked about because they never learn, right? So look, we can't jump on that, uh, you know, declaring ourselves an anti-racist institution until and unless the people who work there like actually know how to do that. All right, here's the last one. Just like I mentioned in point six, that there's too little emphasis in equity work on dismantling classroom racism. There's also too little emphasis on workplace racism. Look, I'll say it again. I'm a student affairs person at heart. I really am. Being a faculty member is just like my, my day job, but I'm a student affairs person at heart. I love students. And I love that there's so much emphasis and institutional attention placed on student success and dealing with racial inequities as it pertains to students. But a similar version of those same inequities exists in the workplace among employees. There are racial tensions oftentimes between employees of color and their white coworkers who oppress them, disrespect them, um, participate in their erasure, participate in the suppression of their promotion and so on, right? Um, there's so much disrespect for women of color in the higher ed workplace. Men of color too, to be absolutely sure, right? But it's women of color that we hear from, you know, most uh, alarmingly, right? So it's my way of saying that I am not sure at all, I'm not sure at all that we will ever achieve equity for students so long as there is tremendous unaddressed inequities among the folks who work at the institutions who are supposedly responsible for student success. All right, what do we do? What do we do about all of this? So I just gave you eight things not to do, right? These are eight trends, eight ways that racial equity is mishandled, eight ways that anti-racism institutionally is mishandled. So I just told you what not to do. Uh, let me tell you what I think you might do instead that is guaranteed to lead to a much better outcome, guaranteed to help CSUN, you know, behave with more integrity around racial equity. Uh, let me start by acknowledging a really important movement. It's the movement for Black Lives. You see, in summer 2020, the movement for Black Lives started before that, by the way, but in summer 2020, following the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, we saw people all across California, all across America and around the globe take to the streets in protest of anti-Black racism, in protest of systemic racism. It was such and continues to be such an important movement. There was something that happened in that movement. It was beautifully interracial. It was also intergenerational. But let me let, let, let me stay, let, let, let me say just a, a bit more about how beautifully interracial it was. We saw not only black folk and not only black and brown folk, you know, standing in solidarity with each other. It was white folks out there too. In summer 2020, white folks were rushing out to buy my friend Ibram Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. It was sold out all across the world because mostly white folks went out in summer 2020 to get the book, to learn, how can I personally become anti-racist? So look, becoming anti-racist as an institution 
first demands of each of us that we start in a personal place, that we recognize um, our personal integrity around being anti-racist, the personal actions that we take, not the broad notion of the institution, but what, what have you done? What have you done to help California State University Northridge achieve racial equity? It requires some personal stock taking. It also requires though, some serious grappling with one's own contradictions. In June, 2020, at the height of the protest around the country and around the globe, I wrote and published uh, three pieces. They came out within three days of each other. One was in Ebony Magazine and the other, another was in the Griot, two of the three pieces, right? One, the one in Ebony Magazine, as you can see, is titled Black Lives Matter, according to Meg. It's about a white woman named Meg who was in the streets marching for Black lives. The other is about what I title here, the, the irony of corporate chucks marching for Black lives. You see, I wrote these two pieces because I was hearing loudly and clearly from Black folks, mostly in corporate environments, a real sense of collective aggravation around the contradictions of performative activism. In both of these pieces, they're publicly available. All you simply got to do is Google the title. They are publicly available and open access. In both of these pieces, I help readers understand how Meg was out there marching in the streets for Black lives with her performative activism in June 2020 because it was so fashionable and in vogue to do so in June 2020. But what Meg, a corporate executive, failed to realize is that she got too few Black people in the, in the division that she leads. Black folks can't stand her because of her racism. She trampled over a Black woman to get the VP job. What she didn't understand was that she's out there marching and taking selfies and posting to Instagram, smiling and all that in June 2020. But it was just in February 2020 when the Black Employee Resource Group came and asked her for $100 to buy food for the Black History Month program. And Meg was like, well, sorry, I don't have it in my budget. And the Black people were like, what do you mean? Ours is a multi-billion dollar global comp company. What do you mean you don't have $100? She was like, yeah, if I give you $100 for you know, Black History Month, then, you know, for Hispanic Heritage Month, they're going to ask me for money. Then in June for Pride Month, sorry, I don't have it in my budget. But yeah, in June, just a few months later, you out there marching for Black lives. Look, let me, let me, let me move on here. I'm just going to talk quickly about, about Chuck. Thing about Chuck is Chuck is seemingly fictitious, but actually he's based on a real person. One of my friends called me. He was like, you'll never believe what I just saw. I just saw my boss on the local news. The local news was out doing coverage of a Black Lives Matter march. And I saw my boss and I nearly fell out um, because this is the same very racist boss who didn't care about black people in real life, but yet was out there with the performative activism in June 2020. Look, the point here for you, the implication for you is to, if you're gonna be out here on the anti-racism train, you better make sure that you've checked your contradictions and understand the ways in which your everyday life undermines what you and your track record and your reputation and the harm that you cause may undermine what you say that you care about. All right, look, uh, let me try to be quick here. Um, becoming an anti-racist institution. I wanna move beyond being an anti-racist person to help us think about what it takes to become an anti-racist institution. It takes some money. It takes financial investments into anti-racism. Um, I wrote a piece, I mentioned to you, there were three pieces. The third was a piece I published in the Washington Post. As you can see, the title here is Corporations Say They Support Black Lives Matter. Their employees doubt them. But why in the world would the Black people doubt the people, right? Okay, so why? Well, there's a thing that was very much, very much on trend in June, 2020. CEOs were sending what affectionately became known as the George Floyd email to every person in their companies 
declaring that the murders of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd were horrific, that racism is bad. And some of them went so far as to even declare that Black Lives Matter. You see, that was laughable to some Black folks, and it was offensive to many others. Why? Because their everyday lived experiences as Black employees in those companies were the antithesis of what the George Floyd email was, was, was saying and declaring. But nonetheless, look, let me do at least acknowledge and applaud and appreciate that, you know, many corporations stepped up with multi-million dollar investments, $100 million here, $10 million there, Bank of America, as well as PNC Bank, each brought a billion dollars to the table um, in support of Black Lives Matter, the NAACP, Urban League, so on and so the United Negro College Fund. I, 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 I applaud all those things. Those, those, those are good. But the lesson here for higher ed institutions is that we have to invest money. In the meeting that I was in just before this one, someone said, and I'm paraphrasing, but the values are in the budget. If anti-racism and racial equity are serious values, of the institution, please highlight for me where in the budget uh, we can map that institutional seriousness. All right, look, I wanna leave some time for uh, a conversation. So let me just, um, let me just, you know, end here by talking about alignment, right? I gave you those eight ways that there's misalignment and contradiction and so on, but let, let's, 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 let's bring this into alignment. Here are 10 things that racial equity requires. 10 things that becoming an anti-racist institution requires. First, it requires investing in the reparation of historical negligence, inequity, violence, and other forms of harm. It requires unapologetically doing so. It requires when folks, you know, you know, come with their critiques saying, well, why are we spending money on this? Because we've not done right by these folks for generations, for decades. That's why, that's why we are investing both human and fiscal resources, it requires reparations. It requires specifying racial equity. Look, let me just say one more time that I appreciate all forms of equity. At the USC Race and Equity Center, we don't just do race. We do other forms of equity. But the point here, right, is that if you are going to jump as an institution on the we are anti-racist institution bandwagon, you got to specify racial equity in your practices, in your initiatives. You got you to say it, it, it's, it's race that we're doing. It's racism that we're taking on with this project with this investment, with this uh, journey that we're on. Can't be broad in precise notions, abstract notions of, oh, we're doing equity. No, like if you're gonna be anti-racist, it's gotta be racism that you are taking on by name, call it by its name. Third, it requires strategy and intentionality. It's time out for the random, we are just gonna put a couple dollars in the chief diversity officer's budget. Look, put some more money in the chief diversity officer's budget. Please do that. Um, but it's time out for, yeah, we're just gonna put a couple of more dollars in that person's budget and leave it to him, her, or them to do all the diversity work for us. Not, not gonna work. Or yeah, we're just gonna, you know, have the cultural centers or multicultural affairs. Nope. Look, it can't be that we're gonna have this one time, what I hope. You're, ex you're experiencing as a really amazing, hopefully very helpful experience with Sean Harper. That ain't gonna do it either, right? The, everything that you do in the name of anti-racism has to be connected to an institutional strategy. That strategy has to be multidimensional. It has to be written. It has to have outcomes and uh, consequences and dollars attached to it. Otherwise, it's just an imaginary thing. It's just magical thinking that we are somehow going to magically become anti-racist without a strategy? I don't think so. Without intentionality? No, no way. Fourth, becoming an anti-racist institution 
requires us to map curricularly and in the co-curriculum where do students learn about race where do they learn about racism where do they learn about their own implicit racial biases implicit biases right is it just in the sociology of race course or in ethnic studies courses but nowhere else across the curriculum? Well, we can't say with integrity that ours is an anti-racist institution. When the teaching and learning about race and racism is segregated to only sociology of race courses, psychology of race, or psychology of blackness courses, or ethnic studies, it has to exist across the curriculum. It has to be integrated across the curriculum. Look, let me be very clear here. I am a huge proponent of ethnic studies. I'm a huge proponent of race-focused courses and courses focused even on specific racial and ethnic groups, huge proponent. But what I'm calling for here is a both and teaching and learning strategy. So it really requires, right, provost to hold deans accountable for showing receipts, as the young people would say, for where the teaching and learning of race is occurring within their respective academic colleges and schools on a campus. It then requires that deans hold department chairs accountable for the furnishing of receipts of where teaching and learning about race and racism are occurring. Then department chairs have to hold their faculty colleagues accountable. Can't be that it's just the one person of color in the department that's doing it though. It's not enough, has to be everybody, has to be coordinated integrated across the curriculum. That's what, if we're gonna be an anti-racist institution, it requires that. It also requires that we assess the campus racial climate. I don't care if you use the national assessment of collegiate campus climates to do it or not. I would certainly invite you to, we'd love to have you. It doesn't have to be our tool, but it has to be a tool. I mean, ours is the most credible one in the, in the industry. I'm just saying, um, but it has to be a tool that will give you some data on the realities of race, on the challenges and opportunities that exist in your campus racial climate. You got to assess the campus racial climate if you are going to credibly claim that yours is an anti-racist institution. But more importantly, you got to then do something with the data. It's not enough to simply assess the climate and then have the findings merely rest on a shelf you got to do something with the data. You have to make the data actionable. You have to use the data to inform your campus strategy to become anti-racist. Look, I wrote a piece in Inside Higher Ed. It's publicly available. Just simply go to uscrec.info slash Harper Pang. Um, or you could just really just do a Google search for Pang to ignore racism. You could find it by its title. It's open access. But it is a piece that I wrote in 2015. Um, you know, just a few months ahead of um, giving the, um, the Terry Piper lecture there at CSUN. But I wrote this piece about how colleges and universities, presidents and provosts and VPs um, had commissioned the then Penn Race and Equity Center at the University of Pennsylvania to come and assess their campus racial climates qualitatively. And I said how they paid us 20, 30 or $40,000 in some instances to assess the campus climate we write them reports back with our findings and recommendations. And months later, at a conference, we run into a person from the campus and they say, you know, the institution never did anything with the report. None of us ever saw it, it never saw the light of day. So in that way, they really were effectively paying us to ignore racism. Uh, so yeah, I wrote about that in Inside Higher Ed. Uh, the NAC doesn't cost 20, 30 or $40,000, $10,000 to use the NAC. But look, the point here is that you got to, make the data actionable. It's not enough to just do the campus climate assessment. You also have to share the findings. The findings have to be transparent. How else are we all going to participate in the project of becoming an anti-racist institution if it's only the president's cabinet who has access to the data that tells us where our vulnerabilities and our opportunities are? I'm over time. Let me, let me wrap this up. Um, I told you there are 10, 10 requirements. Becoming an anti-racist institution requires that we analyze 
and revise our policies and our practices through the prism of racial equity. The truth is at most higher ed institutions, when policies and practices were established, our student bodies were not as diverse as they are now. The truth is our workforces on our campuses were not as diverse as they are now. So it really was overwhelmingly white architects of policies and practices and racial equity and the experiences and needs and outcomes of people of color were not at the forefront of their, of their consciousness when they developed those policies and those practices you know, long ago. So it therefore requires us now in 2021, as we embark on a journey to become anti-racist, to go back and look at everything that we do from admissions and hiring practices through teaching and learning and promotion practices and so on and so forth. Everything that we do through the prism of racial equity. Eight, it requires exchanging deficit lenses about students for stock taking of faculty practices, right? And administrator practices. Stop asking what's wrong with these students and why are they so underprepared to succeed here? Ask instead, why is this faculty so underprepared to serve the needs of 21st century racially, ethnically, and linguistically diverse learners who come to Cal State Northridge? That's the right question. And what remedies are needed? What kinds of steps are needed to help the faculty and leaders become more highly skilled in helping the institution enact its espoused values pertaining to diversity, equity, and inclusion broadly and racial equity and anti-racism specifically. It requires accountability for demonstrable progress on racial equity goals. I'm not into firing people, nor am I into canceling people. I'm like violently opposed to cancel culture, by the way. Uh, but um, firing people, that's, 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 not, that's not my jam. I do wanna make the point here though, that I don't think that people are fired ever for failing to help the institution advance, achieve, and ultimately sustain its diversity, equity, and inclusion agenda. Think about that. Lastly, anti-racism requires professional learning experiences that develop racial literacy among employees and that help faculty, staff members, and campus leaders become more highly skilled at solving racial problems, at talking about race, and achieving racial equity. I'm telling you right now, these are really smart people. They're very smart. But magically, they're not going to overnight become um, racial equity experts. This work requires expertise. Expertise can, in fact, be taught, learned, and developed, but not without a professional learning curriculum. I'm not talking about a one-off afternoon with Sean Harper. That ain't going to do it. You need a whole curriculum for employees of the institution. Look, I'm not talking uh, hypothetically here about um, you know, a curriculum for, for employees. Um, one of the things of which I'm most proud here at the USC Race and Equity Center are two alliances that we established, one in June, 2020, and the other in November, uh, 2020. So just shortly after the uprisings in response to the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, there were lots of community college presidents here in California who were reaching out to the center for guidance and resources and help during that time. They wanted to know, what can I say to my campus community at a time such as this? We established in summer 2020, what we now call the California Community Colleges Racial Equity Leadership Alliance. It is an alliance of 68 uh, community colleges throughout the state of California, uh, several here in Southern California, but really all across the state. Um, every Alliance member institution participates in the, in the NAC, Campus Climate Survey, 
They're gonna be participating in climate surveys for faculty and staff in 2022 and 2023, respectively. But another thing they do is we meet once a month for live, virtual, synchronous, three-hour professional learning experiences on various aspects of race and racial equity at community colleges across California. Each of the 68 member institutions sends employees to these live professional learning sessions. We send those employees back with resources that can be shared with every member of the campus community, all employees. That particular alliance inspired then the creation of the Liberal Arts Colleges Racial Equity Leadership Alliance, which has 71 institutional members all across the United States in every geographic region. Same thing, every one of those 71 institutions do the climate surveys and every one of those 71 institutions send employees to these live three hour professional learning experience, experiences once a month, each on a different topic. These institutions are learning from and alongside each other. Racial equity requires and anti-racism requires that we upskill people who work at institutions on the practice of racial equity. Here's a confession. I have this fantasy about creating an alliance for all of the California State University uh, campuses that really build on and replicate the success that we're seeing with those 68 California community colleges and those 71 liberal arts colleges across the country. All right, hey, look, I'm 11 minutes past time. I apologize to you. Um, sorry that I went on and on. Uh, I just had a lot to say. I hope that you found it useful and I hope that you found it inspirational and instructive as you continue on your quest for racial equity and you continue on a quest to become anti-racist. You can do it with those 10 things that I just shared with you, you can do it. But anything short of that, I think you're gonna end up like so many other colleges and universities that we've seen over the years that have failed to deliver on the promise of inclusion and equity for people of color. I'll stop here and we will engage in 18 minutes of uh, what I hope will be really robust uh, discussion and Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harper, yes. Get a drink of water, woo, drop, dropping truth bombs on all of us, I love it so much. And we're getting so much so many comments and questions. So um, I just wanna thank you for sharing that with us, for really highlighting the way this work has evolved um, in this climate and really um, you know, giving us ideas, concrete examples of tools and things that we need to do if we really wanna embody this principle of anti-racism here at CSUN. So I just wanna thank you and everyone here for for listening and all the wonderful feedback. Um, so our first, one of the first questions we got was, can you provide an example of how institutions effectively use reparations for historical systemic racism? So to address some of those um, longstanding inequities in the system. Yeah, um, hey, I appreciate uh, the praise. I also appreciate the engagement in the chat. I'm seeing some of some great comments. Uh, thank you. You all are very generous. Um, you know, there are some institutions that have created commissions um, to, you know, understand, for example, um, the relationship of their institution with the institution of slavery and how their institutions, you know, either participated in or benefited from profits um, from the, you know, um, enslavement of my people uh, here in, in the US. You know, um, the best examples of those is when the campuses include historians, like the actual like history experts who are on the history faculty. Um, but 
also extend beyond that, right? Engage in, you know, going back and inviting folks to participate in oral histories, you know, uh, people who are who are still alive, um, Black, Indigenous, and other people of color who are still alive, who can engage in some oral history sharing of uh, their experiences with, you know, oppression and marginalization at the institutions, and using those insights to, you know, develop a strategy um, to, you know, um, to repair the harm that's been done. Um, let me say one last thing. Um, this is done best when the people of color who are contemporarily at the institution are consulted for advice on what can this institution do to right the wrongs of its past. I swear to you, if you ask, they'll tell you. The problem is too few institutions ever set a table for students of color, employees of color, and alumni of color to advise the institution on how to invest in the reparation of institutional harm. I have to, I have to take all that in. Okay. Um, I want to introduce my colleague at the USU, um, Ayan Jama. She's going to also be working with me here on some of the question and answers. A tremendous partner. And as you see, two women of color here really facilitating these discussions. As you talked about women of color, it landed pretty personal to me. So I, just really quickly before we turn it on to the next question, and just, just kind of affirm, affirming what you're hearing is um, and what we're seeing too, is that a lot of this work falls on those shoulders. And there's not always a lot of institutional recognition or a way to formally articulate that work and in the emotional and investment it takes to do these types of things at an institution as large as ours. So I just want to thank you for, for highlighting that. My pleasure. Let me also highlight that this is unpaid labor, that it is, you know, really people of color broadly and women of color most especially who are laboring to make the institution do what it says it values, but yet there's no compensation. You gotta pay these people. You gotta pay them for this work. You have to pay them for, um, you know, taking on these, these particular other duties as assigned because mm -hmm. these other duties as assigned are psychologically, um, emotionally, and at times even physiologically hazardous to the people who take who take it on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I am. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Harbour. Um, we're going to get started. Um, again, if you have any questions, please add them to the Q&A function or um, you can raise your hand and we can actually highlight you and you can ask your question verbally. So I'm going to go ahead and um, ask a question that was asked in the chat. Um, what my real accountability look like for professors? What leverage do provosts, deans, and department chairs have? Yeah, that's good. It's a good question. Um, you know, I could really speak from you know, an area of expertise being a faculty member myself. Um, one thing that works really well as it pertains to accountability is when the messaging is, is really clear at every level that this is what we're doing right now, right? This is what is important to us. It's what is important. It's an important imperative of the institution that matters to the president and to the provost when that is effectively communicated to deans, and again, deans communicate that with high expectation then to their uh, department chairs and academic program heads, and those folks then, you know, uh, communicate with seriousness to their faculty colleagues. That's when I see actually an ecosystem of seriousness. It's not like a one-off, like, well, this group of people over here in this particular department really care about social justice, but these folks over here are opting out. We have to make clear that there is no opting out, right? Um, yeah, it, it takes a courageous um, 
it takes a courageous cadre of academic affairs leaders um, to, to, to do that. Let me say something else about a different version of accountability. I know that what I just described is very top down, right? There is a bottom up way uh, to do this as well. Um, I'm really proud actually that during my tenure, the decade that I spent at the University of Pennsylvania, that we in the higher ed division came together with seriousness as a faculty to determine how we were going to integrate diversity, equity, and inclusion broadly and race specifically across the curriculum. Nobody mandated it. The dean didn't require us to do it, but we did it on our own as a faculty. That can and should happen organically that way. There's a way to govern ourselves uh, with high levels of accountability. So I do have an, an inspiring example of how we did that at Penn. I'll also say here at the University of Southern California in the Rasir School of Education, just a year or so uh, before the pandemic, USC Rasir publicly committed itself um, to a new mission of advancing educational equity. We made clear though, that this is not a slogan. It's not a slogan. It has to be, you know, ever present in all that we do. Now, that ever presence is not going to magically show up overnight. It's gonna require us to work at it. Not just that year, but also the, the following year and the year after that and the year after that and the year after that, right? You know, one activity that we've done as a whole faculty is um, we've done assessments of our syllabi using a syllabus review uh, rubric tool um, that's about uh, equity, right? Where either faculty members, um, you know, first would do an appraisal of their own syllabi using the rubric, but also we did peer review where, you know, people did assessments of each other's syllabi. And, you know, through these syllabus review workshops, they then turned into, all right, the next chapter, now that we understand, you know, and mapped where the teaching and learning is occurring or not occurring as it pertains to educational equity. Now, how do we help our faculty colleagues do it? There was virtually no resistance. I mean, we're talking faculty members, right? So you're gonna get some resistance, but not a whole lot, right? Folks understood that this is the assignment. Um, this is the assignment, given that we've committed ourselves to this mission. Uh, maybe you don't have to, I don't know that you have to necessarily uh, create a whole new mission, but if it is the assignment from the president and from the provost to the deans, and that assignment then is given to the chairs and the academic program leads, then it permeates every academic space on the campus. Right, we're quickly running out of time. So, I, you know, there's a couple of questions in the Q&A about racial climate and campus climate. Um, I guarantee you that this is not a, a one-off, that we are thinking about how to connect this to our roadmap work. We have a new president, Dr. Harper, as we made you aware of, and a lot of this work will be interwoven in how we approach those types of programming and processes. Um, I, I want to I know there's a hand raised by Tracy in the in the chat if she wants to go ahead and then we're going to wrap up the discussion piece and let Dr. Watkins kind of leave us with some words of wisdom. So Tracy, can you unmute and ask your sure. question? Hi, yes. Yeah. Um, thank you for this amazing um, opportunity. This was, it really struck a chord with me, especially when you were talking about the reparations and harms that um, schools have done to um, BIPOC students. As a returning student, I'm 55 years old and I have been going to school off and on since I graduated from high school in 1984. And listening to what you were saying about, I always felt that it was my fault 
mm. that um, I didn't finish school, that it was something that I was doing wrong. And it wasn't. And th- knowing that it wasn't my fault and going, wow, it's not me, it's them. And constantly asking for help. Mm-hmm. And because coming at somebody saying, well, you should know how to do this, especially you're an upperclassman. Why don't you know how to do this? Why don't you know how to do that? Because no one taught me how to do it. But making it to be felt like the fool because I don't know how. And so then I would drop out and come back and drop out and come back. And no one should ever feel like that. But this is, you know, so you have all the school student debt and no degree. That part. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That part. That part. Um, I so appreciate you, um, you know, sharing so generously and just like in such a spot on fashion. Uh, w- what you just described is so consistent with my research. I just put in the chat a link to an article that I published a couple of years ago with two colleagues of mine. It's about a fictitious. Well, actually, it's not fictitious. It's a real place. It's a real place. We just gave it a pseudonym. Um, you know, as, as I was hearing you talk, it reminded me so much of Cityville University, the university that we write about in this article. Um, I encourage you to, and everybody else, everybody, please click the link that I just put in the chat and read this article because it's going to help you understand how we ask the wrong questions about student success and how we're not, and, and I, I'm just gonna paraphrase here, right? Like how, you know, like we make students feel like it's their fault that they're not succeeding, but yet there's so many environmental toxins and barriers and, you know, just like inexcusable cultural phenomena at these institutions that undermine student success sense of belonging, inclusion, wellness, and so on. Please read the paper to put in the chat. Um, I know that we're at time, so I wanna for sure make sure that we uh, leave enough time for your provost uh, uh, to make some some concluding remarks. Let me just once again appreciate having been invited once again uh, to be with you, um, albeit virtually this time. Look, I live just right across town, invite me, to Cal State Northridge anytime I will happily come back, but I do want to appreciate Deborah Hammond and everybody else um, who were a part of today's experiences. I really, really, really uh, appreciated it. Okay, I'll stop there. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. Here here he is, the man, the, the myth, the legend, Dr. Watson <laughs> to close us out. <laughs> Well, you know, who could follow Dr. Harper? And um, Sean, if, I know you're still there. And I think the most important concluding remarks that I could make right now is my own personal dedication to making sure that you are part of our journey here. You're too close. We pay attention to everything you do and we need to take it to the next level. You came to us several years ago and talked about magical thinking. And if we simply listen to you and take notes and do nothing more, we're engaged in another form of just the same. The whole notion of acting with uh, integrity around uh, racial equity and anti-racism, I take to heart. Uh, We've seen those things that have been said and pledged and et cetera. It's time for Cal State Northridge really to begin to get busy. Uh, I have nothing but notes here and notes upon notes. And I really believe that there is work that we have to do together through the the leadership and guidance and inspiration that you can provide for us all. You've been seeing what's in the chat. I've been seeing what's in the chat. We need to do something together. And if the university can't, student affairs will, um, since you're student affairs by heart. Thank you for lifting us and permitting us to become refocused on what the real work is not the work of the moment, not the soup du jour, but what is at the core of moving the needle for success and change for our students. They deserve everything we can give to them and they are not the problem, we are. But we can solve the problem. We in higher education do just that. 
when we are intentional and in committing to committed to making it happen. And so I really do hope that you're a part of, of our future here. I can tell you that uh, um, Dr. Boca Negra has been in spaces lately talking about CSUN student success and takes everybody through this nice set of charts and then gets to race. Voila, and really begins to tell people that that is the difference in outcomes more pointedly than any other measure that we are uh, observing. So it's time to deal with the elephant in the room. And I hope that you will be on the journey with us to ensure that we are better tomorrow than we are today. Thank you so very much. And thank you all for coming and, and sharing in this great occasion. We want to thank the Matador uh, Success Committee, the University Student Union, the Chief Diversity Officer, uh, our Office of Student Success. Um, we must continue to hold together and be a part of the change that we want to see happen. Thanks so very much.